Good morning everyone and thanks very much for joining us. My name's Laura Marsden and I'll be hosting this webinar discussing some of the guidance that's been issued by the Charity Commission in response to COVID-19. I'm joined by my colleague Siobhan Mulry who will discuss the job retention scheme and other employment based points that will be useful to those of you in the sector. Um, Siobhan and I will speak for about 30 to 45 minutes, so we should have time for questions at the end. Please use the chat box if you'd like to submit a question. The session is being recorded and we'll send out the recordings afterwards as well as uploading them to our website. Please also free, feel free to contact us directly using the contact details there on the screen or you can use the events at Erwin Mitchell email address. And thanks very much to those of you that sent questions in advance of today's session. I'll answer those as we go through. So it's now almost 10 weeks since lockdown began and life changed for us all in ways we'd never imagined. Over the last few weeks, we've all felt shock, fear, loss and despair. There have also been countless inspirational displays of kindness, community spirit, charity, and courage. The sense of isolated intimacy is quite surreal at times. I think there's about 60 of us here today sitting alone in rooms, hopefully with a cup of tea, in various parts of the UK. We're all alone but also connected and here together. So many shops remain closed, events cancelled and budgets shattered. How do we emerge from this and what will we find when we do? How can we rebuild our organisations and how can we make sure that things change for good? Well, these are obviously massive questions and I don't have the answers to them. My hope, which I'm sure is shared by us all, is that the spirit of kindness, community and charity that we've seen so many examples of over the last few weeks continues as we slowly emerge from lockdown. We know certain shops can reopen over the next fortnight, but we don't really know when other places within our communities will reopen or what the government guidelines will be. One of the questions we were asked in advance was about the Commission's guidelines on places being open to the public again. This will be published in due course when the government has made those further announcements. So for now, risk assessments can only really be done in accordance with the current guidelines and trying to anticipate what the new ones might be. Social distancing and the use of PPE is probably going to continue for some time, which for those working with vulnerable groups is obviously very difficult and a real challenge. Another question that we were asked beforehand related to accepted charities and what the plans are in respect of those, what the guidelines are, etc. Well, for accepted charities, the guidance is just the same as it is for registered charities. They must comply with charity law and their trustees have just the same responsibilities as the trustees of registered charities. So in terms of an overview, um, in, in this session, we'll look at some of the financial support that's available to charities from government and other sources. Siobhan will discuss the financial help from an employment perspective. We'll look at meetings and focus on how virtual meetings, particularly AGMs, might be used during lockdown. And we'll discuss whether your organisation is able to participate in the effort to tackle issues raised by the pandemic and how you might adapt or change your charitable objects accordingly. Finally, we'll have a quick look at fundraising and other ways that you might be able to raise money in, in these uncertain times. So I'll just move this slide on if I can. Here we go. Oh, we've gone. To, we've gone one too far. There we go. Great. So the financial support that's available. Well, the government has pledged 750 million to help organisations continue vital work during the pandemic. These can all be found at the government web on the government website. The, the links there on the slide. Um, last week, the um, National Lottery Community Fund opened on the it was on last Friday, the 22nd of May. 
which is aimed at small to medium sized charities. Applications for that are considered on a first come first serve basis and the funds specifically targeted at organisations that are encountering disproportionate challenges as a result of coronavirus and those whose purposes are to support vulnerable people and community building activity. Existing grant holders are being prioritised for that and it's only available to organisations in England. The Charity Bank has also compiled a wider list of emergency funds, including several specific grants and um, it, the, the list also covers funds that are available for the, in the rest of the UK. So there are quite a few grants out there, but there'll obviously be many, many applications. Some of the funds have got application deadlines and quite a few of those, particularly um, for those organisations in the arts and cultural sector have already passed. New funds will be released, so it's obviously worth noting all the deadlines and tracking the announcement of further funds. The government has also announced loans that may be accessed by those in the sector. The Resilience and Recovery Loan Fund has been established to make the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme more easily accessible to charities and social enterprises. The eligibility criteria for that is that it must be a UK based registered charity, community interest company or community benefit society with a turnover of between 400,000 and 45 million. The organisation must have been trading for a minimum of two years and it must self certify that it's been adversely affected by COVID-19. That's obviously not going to be suitable for all organisations. There's also the bounce back loan scheme, which was announced on the 4th of May. Um, and that's that should help enable businesses and charities to obtain a six year loan at a government set interest rate of 2.5% a year and the first year will be of interest will be covered by the government. The, the loans under that are between 2000 and £50,000. Obviously a time of great uncertainty, very careful consideration will be needed ahead of any decision to borrow money. If your charity is getting into financial difficulty, then the trustees need to be very familiar on the Charity Commission guidance in respect of that and managing financial difficulties, which can be found in the CC12 Charity Commission guidance document. Obviously, if there's a risk of insolvency, then you need to seek professional advice. So I'll hand over to Siobhan now, who can discuss things from an employment perspective. Thank you, Laura. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to predominantly look at the coronavirus job retention scheme, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, as well as some of the key employment issues for charities arising out of this pandemic. Um, so first of all, on the, the basics of the furlough scheme, the scheme was announced in March and has been hugely successful. Um, recent statistics are 8.3 million have been furloughed with more than 6.8 billion claimed via 2.3 million applications. Um, the online claim system started processing claims in April and as many of you will have experienced it typically takes just a few days before the money is paid out to employers. The scheme currently pays for up to 80% of wages up to a maximum of 2,500 per month um, and employees must have been on the payroll on the 19th of March. It can be used for a whole range of workers, so um, full time employees, part time agency workers, zero hours workers. Um, Employee, uh, sorry, employers may agree to top up the pay, but you don't have to. Um, and the Charity Commission has said that they are aware that charities are faced with having to make difficult and time pressured decisions um, and need to give regard to the usual um, regulatory framework where obligations to spend funds only to further the objectives of the charity, acting in the best interest of the charity and ensuring that the charity remains resilient. 
Um, as you might be aware, some high profile charities have said that they are topping up the additional 20% of wages, or at least topping up to ensure that their staff are receiving at least the National Living Wage Foundation pay level. Um, and some of you may have seen just this morning, there are reports in the press that the Chancellor is thinking of introducing a requirement for employers to top up the additional 20% in due course. And we remain to see how that will impact on some of the charity obligations. If you are topping up pay and it is in the charity's best interest to do that and you have the resources available whilst remaining resilient, I think it's unlikely that it will raise any regulatory concerns. But what I would suggest on that is to make sure that you do keep a good paper trail um, documenting why you consider that it's in the charity's best interests, regard to the resources available um, and forecasts with regard to likely future income. Um, it is available to all employers at the moment, um, but there are specific rules if you do receive public funding um, and there are particular uh, guidance around this within the government guidance that is specific circumstances in which the furlough scheme can be used where you receive public funding. Um, that is where the, the services are not required at the moment. Those employees would otherwise be made redundant or laid off. Um, they're not involved in delivering provision that has already been funded, not required to deliver services for a vulnerable child or a critical worker. Um, and importantly, where you're furlough furloughing, that wouldn't lead to financial reserves being created. So in other words, you wouldn't be profiting from the use of the furlough scheme. Um, now, there are often difficulties around deciding whether or not some, an individual's pay is covered by public funds or not, where you haven't necessarily divided, um, where it's not necessarily that apparent that an employee's costs are attributable to either private or public funding. Um, but the scheme does encourage that you, that you use the furlough scheme proportionately in those circumstances. So moving on to some of the principles of furlough. The next slide. Thank you. Um, so an employee has to agree to be furloughed. It does re represent a change to their terms and conditions. So it needs to be agreed. And if you are looking to agree that with more than 20 employees, then there are specific collective consultation obligations which may need to be complied with. Um, must last for a minimum of three weeks, although we understand the government is under pressure to reduce this to one week and the employee isn't allowed to carry out any work for their employer whilst they're furloughed. Um, now, one question we've had from um, charities is, can a furloughed employee volunteer for you? So whilst furloughed, an employee or worker can take part in volunteer work, but not where they're providing services or generating revenue for your organisation or a linked or associated organisation. Um, there's nothing to prevent a charity from trying to find furloughed employees new work or volunteering opportunities whilst they are furloughed, provided that's in line with public health guidance. Um, but as I say, you can't be requiring them to work for your organisation um, and you can't require them to volunteer anywhere else. Um, on the plus side, there are there will of course be a number of other employees who are furloughed from other charities or private companies um, who can volunteer for you, provided that that's permitted by their terms of employment. <clears throat> so moving on to the latest developments with the scheme. Um, the scheme has been extended to the end of October, but there will be more flexibility from the 1st of August which I've just outlined on the, the next slide. So from the 1st of August, workers can return part time and be furloughed for the remainder of their contractual hours. Employers will have to contribute to the cost. Um, we don't yet know the percentage, 
um, but we believe that employees must still continue to receive 80% of the pay for the hours not working up to £2,500 cap. Um, we expect that the scheme will remain open for employers in all regions, even those who are open but you've not claimed before. Um, sorry, if, if you are open but you've not came, claimed before, you may be excluded. Um, I've put on the slide that more detail is expected by the end of May. Now, of course, we are on the 29th of May today and we haven't yet had more detail, um, but watch this space because we do believe that some, some more detail will be coming shortly. Um, also, according to the Financial Times, the Chancellor has said that it, he wants to stop new applicants from joining, to stop them going on furlough, then immediately coming back off it to work part time leaving the Treasury to pick up the bill. So I imagine that something will be announced and it will be a quite a sudden change so that there isn't that opportunity for um, some organisations potentially to take advantage of it in that way. So moving on from furlough, I'm just going to touch on some of the other... Oh, apologies if anyone can hear my dog go mad. Um, Moving on to some of the other types of financial help that's available in relation to your staff. Um, so statutory sick pay is available in a number of circumstances relating to coronavirus, for example, if someone's required to self-isolate even though they're not ill, um, and that is available from day one. And if you have fewer than 250 employees as at the 28th of February, then you can claim a rebate in relation to that. I've also mentioned on this on the slide here the self-employed income support scheme, um, whereby 80% of average monthly trading profits are paid in a single instalment covering three months capped at 7,500. So that, that might be relevant if you do have any self-employed <coughs> consultants or workers working for you. Um, I understand that most eligible people have been asked to make a claim between the 13th and the 18th of May, so those claims should already have been made in respect of those workers. Um, and then finally, just keep an eye on the government website in relation to financial support that's available, and I know Laura has already touched on that anyway, um, to see what financial support is available to you, and of course the Charity Commission website as well. So that, that's, that's it in relation to um, employment related matters. Um, but as I say, we'll, I'll still be here for the Q&A at the end. So please do feel free to put through any questions on the Q&A section. Or if there are any specific queries, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, and I'll just hand back to Laura now. Thank you. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, someone's just been knocking very loudly on my door, <laughs> but obviously I will ignore that. Let's move on um, and look at meetings. <clears throat> just move that slide along. So we've um, face to face meetings have obviously been out of the question for the last few weeks and I'll have had to be cancelled or postponed. All decisions regarding the postponement or cancellation must be recorded to demonstrate good governance in the organisation. This is particularly important if you're unable to hold your AGM, which may in turn make it difficult to fin finalise your annual reports and accounts. You may have heard um, that the Commission's taking a flexible and pragmatic approach to regulation during the crisis and they're extending the period during which you can file your reports and accounts. If your filing date is imminent, then you should contact them using the email address that's on the slide um, and obviously make sure you include your registration number and name of the charity. I spoke to the Commission earlier this week and they suggested that the extension would be for six months, although there was a bit of a question mark over that. If you apply for an extension you, via the email address, you'll receive an automated reply and that should contain further information. For charitable companies, Companies House has also extended the filing deadlines 
and whilst the, the contact centre is closed at the moment, so all enquiries need to go to the email address that's on that slide. So let's focus on AGMs and do you need to hold an AGM? Well, depending on your structure, you might not be obliged to do so. You'll need to check your governing document to see what the provisions are. If you're a charitable company, for example, you only need to hold an AGM if your articles say so. So in terms of options, if you don't need to have one, then don't. Or you could delay the meeting, push it back to later in the year, hope for a change or um, a change in the rules or relaxation of lockdown, but also plan for the worst. So what happens if we do end up with a second wave and we return to a lockdown? Finally, you could hold a virtual meeting. So many charities will already have provision in their governing documents that allow meetings to take place by way of telephone or video conference. If you're unsure whether your charity is able to do that, then obviously check your governing document. If there's no provision in there and you decide to hold a virtual meeting anyway, then in line with that pragmatic approach, the Commission has said that they'll understand but you should make sure that the decision is recorded again to reflect good governance. If your governing document includes an express prohibition on holding virtual meetings, then you'd need to change that before you proceed to have one. But help may be at hand by way of the Corporate, Insol Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill which includes provisions relating to AGMs. It was published last week on the 20th of May and if passed in its current format, it should resolve many of these issues. It, will, it applies to companies, registered societies and charitable incorporated organisations, CIOs, and it will apply from 20th of Mar 26th of March to the 30th of September. So it's going to be retrospective. And it mean, it'll mean that a meeting can be held virtually and so those participating don't need to be in the same place. It should mean that any issues with quorum and the ability to hold a virtual meeting are overridden. So essentially, it won't matter what it says in your governing document. You'll be able to hold a virtual meeting anyway. It's a really significant change and although the intention is to fast track it through Parliament, it's not law yet. So we need to keep an eye on that. Hopefully it should receive royal assent soon. So how do you run a virtual meeting? Well, it's going to de it depend on the size of your membership and what, what's the required quorum. Can you satisfy it? Um, looking at Zoom, for example, um, that platform allows up to 100 participants in a meeting, but you can take that up to 500 with an add-on. You should also consider whether the meeting is going to be accessible to all members, bearing in mind not everyone will be familiar with these platforms, that we're, although we are all, a lot of us using them more now. Things like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts. Also, some members may not have internet access. How will votes be conducted? You could use separate survey software for this, such as electionbuddy.com or SurveyMonkey, but check the security of those additional pieces of software. Who's going to chair the meeting? Ideally, not the person who's dealing with technology, because that would probably be too much for one person to do. And it'd be good to encourage proxies so that people can cast their votes ahead of the meeting. Consider what will happen if a poll is demanded. So you'll need a method for that. Some platforms have poll functions that you can add on again by way of an app. You'll also need to consider connection and security issues. A lot of the virtual platforms allow you to restrict access, so make sure that you use that function. And you could also use the waiting rooms so that you can approve access and monitor who's actually in attendance. Obviously, it'd be sensible to do a trial run and you could perhaps use a committee meeting or a board meeting to do that first try out a couple of the voting mechanisms and you could also use the Q&A box as we'll be doing in this session. You'll obviously need to communicate with members afterwards and send the minutes and votes after the meetings. Um, 
so you could consider recording it and uploading it to your website afterwards. And you might also want to hold another meeting when lockdown ends so that at a later date you can ratify what was decided at the meeting. Members can then approve what happened at the virtual meeting, which gives the trustees some comfort and protection. So in terms of the process, it's likely that you'll probably use a combination of methods. If you usually post your notice of AGM and proxy forms, then you can still do that. Um, it might just be the meeting itself that's held virtually. Your agenda and notice will need to provide clear instructions though on the use of technology and you, you might want to ask members to submit any questions in advance to make things easier. But it's obviously not just AGMs that could be conducted virtually, any meeting can be conducted in this way. Um, we were asked before today's session, how can a charity be wound up if its members can't meet? So obviously, unfortunately, with the numerous challenges that the sector's faced with, it will mean that some charities sadly will have no option but to close. And the governing document will set out what the dissolution provisions are. And it will depend on the size of the membership and whether it's feasible to hold a virtual general meeting. If not, then it might be possible to dissolve by way of a special written resolution. It will depend on what the structure of your organisation is and what the provisions are in your governing document. For example, a written resolution to dissolve a CIO must be unanimous. It would be wise to seek professional advice if you're considering closure, especially in light of the current risks and the circumstances. So let's look at, can move on to the next slide. We'll look at how you can respond to the crisis. Obviously, lots of charities will have are already responding because their objects directly relate to the kind of help that's severely needed right now. So charities whose objects include the relief of poverty, the relief of need, hardship or distress, and the advancement of health, and those charities that help the elderly or young people are already doing much to help with the crisis. Whether your charity can help directly will depend what your objects are and the powers at which will be set out in your governing document. If your charity wants to adapt what it does, then you might be able to do this indirectly. So, for example, lots of arts charities are helping to relieve loneliness and isolation by working online and producing content there. If you're considering how your charity might help, then you'll need to check whether your objects contain any restrictions. For example, if you can only benefit people within a specific geographical area or within a certain class. If your objects don't allow you to assist with the crisis, then you'll need to change them if, if you want to assist. But careful thinking is required here. Are there other charities that are better placed or better equipped to help? And what will be the wider long term impacts of changing your objects? Will it have a negative impact on your existing beneficiaries? And is the plan sustainable? If you do want to change your objects, then you'll need to check whether your trustees have got the power to do so. Is there an express power in the governing in your governing document? If your organisation is a charitable company or CIO, you'll need the Commission's consent before any resolutions are passed to make changes. The changes have to be reasonable and consistent with what your charity already does and not undermine your existing objects. The Commission said that it's, it's prioritising urgent requests that are made as a result of COVID-19 and their turnaround time for dealing with those requests is currently 48 hours which is pretty good. Remember, if you're a charitable company or a CIO, you need member consent by way of a special resolution once you've got the Commission's consent to the change. So at the moment, it might be passed, that resolution might be passed at virtual general meeting or by way of a special written resolution that's circulated to members. Again, it will decide, it will depend on the size of your membership and also whether there are any other provisions in your governing document as to which method is most suitable for your organisation. So let's look at um, fundraising and, and 
corona and coronavirus appeals. So there's a useful document that's existing guide, guidance from the Charity Commission which about running emergency appeals and that's in the CC40 document. If you're facing financial difficulty and you have grant funding then obviously talk to your funders if they've given money for a particular activity or project which is now impossible then speak to them and see if it's possible if you can carry over the funding or use it for a different purpose. London funders has collated a list of over 350 organisations that have signed a declaration to say they'll be flexible and as helpful as possible so check that list of signatories the link is on that slide um, and see if your funders have signed up to that. The fundraising regulator has also published information about cancelling or postponing fundraising events. You can obviously continue to fundraise and do so in accordance with the fundraising code. You might consider working with a non-charitable organisation to raise funds and there are several ways that you can do that. You can provide a service or run a project together and as Siobhan mentioned, staff can be seconded or can volunteer for your organisation. You could also enter into a commercial partnership to raise funds. Of course, you must ensure that it's in the charity's best interests and that it's supported by the trustees and any activities that you carry out must be done so in accordance with your charitable objects. You'll need to identify, address and review all the risks as well as the benefits and consider conflict of interest and reputational risks to your charity. With decisions having to be made so quickly and amid such uncertainty, the risks are increased. So as ever, trustees must be mindful of their duties. If they haven't already done so, then it'd be useful for trustees to familiarise themselves with the guidance from the Charity Commission in the Essential Trustee CC3 document and also Charities and Risk Management, which is the CC26 guidance. If you're considering entering into a commercial partnership, then you should follow the Commission's guidance on doing so. And you'll also need to follow the fundraising code, which sets out the requirements in the Charities Act. This is a really complex area, so you should certainly seek professional advice if you're considering this as an option. So whilst we've not um, we've not been able to address everything there, um, I'm just trying to move on to the next slide, it won't let me do it. I hope this session has been useful in some way. Um, this session is, is one in a series that we've been presenting here and all recordings are available to view on the website. There are quite a few recordings that would be helpful to you on other legal and financial points. So just to flag those, there's a couple of webinars about contracts and how these might be interpreted or varied as a result of the pandemic. There's also an employment law webinar which again talks about the job retention scheme in perhaps more detail than we've looked at today. Um, and earlier this week, one of my colleagues presented a webinar covering directors' duties, which would also be a helpful refresher for the trustees of charitable companies, bearing in mind they have statutory obligations under the Companies Act as well as the Charities Act. Um, all the previous, all the webinars are there on the website um, in, in that section that you can see on the screen now. We're running these on a weekly basis, so please let us know if you've got any specific issues that you'd like us to cover in future and feel free to ring or email me or Siobhan if there's anything you'd like to discuss that we didn't touch on today. Also, if you've got a minute or two at the end to provide feedback, that would be really appreciated. So let's see, have we got any questions? <laughs> Employment questions that I can look at. So, um, one one question which has come through is: Do you have a, a risk assessment or template checklist to 
provide charities with a guide for helping move staff from home working back to office based work. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a standard template for charities to use in those circumstances because, as you'll appreciate, within the charity sector, there's a vast array of different types of roles. Um, you know, you could be thinking about office based, people working in people's homes, um, retail based. There, there is likely to be a requirement on um, organisations to carry out specific risk assessments before um, moving back people back into the workplace. Um, and we can advise on those specific risk assessments based on your particular organisation and, and the requirements of your staff. In general terms, it would be following health and safety obligations, so looking at government guidance, um, trying to impose social distancing where possible, um, making hand washing facilities available, um, additional cleaning, considering one way flow routes through the workplace, um, having a stable group of employees in separate areas and potentially providing suitable PPE. Um, ultimately, if you have people working from home and they can continue to work from home, then the government is clear that that, that is still what they should be doing. Um, in relation to home working, we've had a query as can employees home working claim costs incurred such as heating, electricity, etc. Um, so the, the position is that um, the employer has to agree to that. So some employers aren't paying those contributions because they are saying that staff are saving on other costs such as travel, etc. Um, but there, there is a tax relief equivalent to £6 per week available and there's guidance on that on the government website for employees who are working from home for these additional costs. Um, query we've had in relation to sick pay. So with sick pay rebate, is it just SSP that you can claim back? Um, yes, it is just the statutory sick pay and it's only if you fall within that bracket of having 250 employees or less. Um, and then a secondary question to that, if someone has to isolate, is the employer obliged to treat this person as sick leave, even, the person, even though the person's well enough to work? Um, so when, when you do have someone who, who is required to self-isolate, but ordinarily they would be available to work because they're not actually ill. So first and foremost, if they can work from home, then they should do that um, and you pay them as normal for working from home. If their role can't be work from home, then the legislation is in place to ensure that they can receive at least statutory sick pay. Now, if you offer any contractual sick pay in addition to statutory sick pay, um, whether or not that a person can um, recover or can claim the sick pay from you very much depends on what your own policy is. Now, arguably, um, they aren't incapacitated as, as would normally fall under that category for contractual sick pay, so you could, in theory, exclude them but you need to balance um, the cost of doing that against the risk of putting that person in financial difficulty to the extent that they would then come into work and potentially um, spread the virus. So um, we encourage employers to be uh, generous in these circumstances as much as you reasonably can, um, but as a minimum, yes, they would be entitled to statutory sick pay. Um, oh. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, I'm just Is checking the, the, the other employment queries. There was another one around um, if they can continue to work from home, can they do so as opposed to claiming SSP? Yes. Um, so yes, if they're working from home, then they'd just be paid as normal because they'd be regarded as, as working. I think that's all the employment related ones. So the, a couple, um, yeah, just to clarify about um, meetings, if the governing document 
he's silent about virtual meetings so it doesn't mention them and it doesn't contain any provisions is it okay to do it anyway well in line with what the charity commission has said in that it will understand if charities want to do this then yes it will be okay but again just keep a paper trail make sure that the decision to do that is documented to to demonstrate good governance um, the bill that we mentioned as well we, we could help um, resolve that issue. Um, do you, also, there was another question regarding AGMs and whether you have to hold another meeting once face-to-face -face meetings are allowed in order to ratify what was decided that the virtual AGM. You don't have to, um, but you may choose to do so. 